breakfast. Good morning, and welcome to Comics for Breakfast. I'm your host, Jason Mink. I'm lucky enough to share a love of Archie Comics with my kid. Over the years, her other comic book interests have bloomed and waned, but Archie has remained a favorite. Unlike many of my other purchases, I can buy a stack of Archies knowing that they're going to be enjoyed by someone other than just me. That said, sometimes even the kid has to put up a hand and say, No, Dad. Case in point, Archie, 3000. Now, when I suggested this to the kid, she reacted as though I'd offered her something that I had just sneezed on, with a gentle but persistent negative. And who could blame her? This looks horrible. My eight-year-old doesn't remember Ray-Bans or hair gel, and yet she has an intrinsic resistance to these things that I can't help but be a little bit proud of. So, is it as bad as all that? Let's dive in and see. In the first tale, Answer or Else, the gang goes on a wacky game show. What makes it so wacky? Shoulder hoops on the suit jackets for a start. At any rate, the game is essentially Family Feud meets Double Dare, where guests answer questions. When they answer correctly, they get a point. When they're wrong, they have to do a crazy stunt. For example, Archie and his pals are loaded into an anti-gravity chamber, and they try and catch half a cup of water in a paper cup. Or deactivate pie-throwing robots. you think Jughead would just eat those. The pies, not the robots. <laughs> As team leader, the onus is on Juggy to answer the questions, but here he's cast as some sort of moron instead of the slacker rebel that he's always been. Nonetheless, in the final round, when asked about his favorite subject, food, Jughead does know the answer. However, due to answering before triggering the buzzer, he's disqualified, making the Riverdale teens the game's losers. In the end, the gang chased Jughead out of the studio, presumably with the intent of beating the crap out of him. So yeah, these are clearly not your father's Archies. In Diet Riot, Betty and Veronica are down at Pop's Astro Malt Shop. After a catty comment from Ronnie about bets packing on the pounds, the girls decide to go on a diet. Pops overhears this, and heedless of the girls' desire for health or self-improvement, tries to find a way to keep them sucking down the suds, ordering a new non-caloric ice cream. Ah, I've seen this movie before. A representative from Diatech beams in and makes his pitch. The girls overhear it and demand to try the product. The rep knows a good thing when he sees it. He'll provide Pops with all the free ice cream he needs if Betty and Veronica agree to promote the shady stuff. It seems like a good deal, but the obvious wrinkle here is that the non-caloric product is just regular old ice cream. For taking place in the future, this sure feels like an I Love Lucy episode. With the girls going to town on the stuff, it's not long before Ronnie can't jam her can into the front seat of her space car, with Jughead getting in this little dig. Snarky. <laughs> Meanwhile, across town, Betty struggles to get into her own pants. The girls realize they've been snowed and conspire to turn the tables on the conniving salesman. They appear at their first public appearance looking like a pair of violet guards, leading to chaos on the set. Only it turns out our gals haven't hit the plus size. They've just packed their suits with padding, sweating off the extra pounds panels earlier. Hey... This might be the future, but there are still no fat kids in Riverdale. In our final tale, the gang head off to investigate the latest cutting-edge pop phenomena, the convenience store. Okay, 
Now, I know that the world is Archie is meant to be quaint and retro, but this comic book came out in 1989, and the first convenience store opened in 1963, so it's not like the idea of a store that's open all night should be a surprise to anyone. The joke is the store operates on Martian hours, which isn't really all that funny, and I don't know. doesn't make all that much sense either. <laughs> The gang board a 3D simulation which can replicate any time period, so naturally they head to... The Jurassic? You'd think Jughead would want to be the first in line to eat a McDonald's hamburger or something, but no, we need to do a dumb running from dinosaurs joke instead. The machine then starts dropping them off into random scenarios like the time of Henry VIII, because what kid wouldn't get that reference? Or, quasi-ironically, the 1950s, where they run afoul of a violent biker gang. Luckily, before anything legitimately interesting can happen, the time limit expires and the gang escapes their fate. What they thought would happen to them for the equivalent of 25 cents, we have to guess. Do entertainment devices routinely murder people in the future? If so, it's a pretty good deal. The biggest problem with all of this is obvious. These stories have nothing to do with Archie and the gang in anything but the most peripheral manner. They're just sort of there as stuff happens. I figure we're meant to empathize with the kids as they deal with the ins and outs of life in the 30th century, but it doesn't work because they're from the 30th century. They shouldn't be befuddled by modern game shows. They grew up watching them. Now, this might work if this were meant to be the real Archie, somehow thrown forward a thousand years in time, but it's not. This is future Archie, and he should be on top of all this stuff. That's this comic's real failing. In spite of being Archie, in the future, no less, you still have a bunch of clueless adults trying to write down to young readers. Let's just say it's not a great fit. And now we head back from the future to the weird, wild world of Archie Spire crossovers. Writer-artist Al Hartley, already employed by MLJ, publishers of the Archie line, convinced the company to allow him to produce a series of comics featuring the typically randy Riverdale gang espousing uncharacteristically Christian values. How could this come to be? Well, it turns out John L. Goldwater, publisher of the Archie line, was a longtime conservative voice when it came to comics. As part of the Comics Code Authority, he's seen the industry dismantled from the top down, reduced to a shell of its former self by the dictates of his own shallow morality. Indeed, Goldwater allowed Hartley to use all of the Archie characters for free, although it was probably a kickback when it came to profit. Now, this is the very first of Spire's Archie publications, so if they make a movie, I'm sitting on a key issue. Let's get right into it. But bear in mind, my focus is going to be on the comic itself and not the messages within. We're not here to mock anyone's beliefs or faith, but mocking a formerly fun comic book company that suddenly decides to take the moral high ground when they built their fortunes on hornball teenagers, that's certainly game. Let's do it. In our first story, we hit upon a subject near and dear to Jughead, and that's food. Free food, no less. Only nothing in life is really free, and before you know it, some denim apostle is pushing the check. Jughead being Jughead crams in as much grub as he can, essentially playing along to appease his insatiable appetite. Oddly enough, no one hits him with a gluttony charge. I guess some things are just too on the nose, and Jughead's nose is already structurally deficient as it is. Preachy Pete here makes his case, and Chuggy really seems committed, although it's safe to assume he's just waiting them out to make room for the next round of sandwiches. The next story concerns the Better World pageant, a student carnival featuring some big words. No, not Penetralia or Isocarboxazid, but like that. The idea is to choose a single word emblematic of a world-changing philosophy. The kids make the case for their chosen words. Dilton feels the best way forward is to learn, which seems pretty reasonable. However, Betty drowns him out in a rain of semantical bullcrap, and the conflict-adverse adults quickly move on. 
Veronica's choice is the word earn, positioning money as the solution to life's problems. Hey, she's not too far off, but the gang go after her too. How about this dig from Big Ethel? Look, Ronnie may be selfish and short-sighted with a bloated ego and an inflated sense of self-worth, but did you ever get the sense that she was unhappy? Sour grapes, Ethel. The next presentation isn't by the kids at all, but by a gang of dicey-looking hippies out to burn it all down. Who let them in here? Seriously, they even have their own stage with balloons and everything. Someone at the school had to sign off on this. But before things can devolve into Altamont, Betty takes a setter stage, only something is not right here. I mean, look at her eyes. These characters were always drawn with over-exaggerated peepers, but these things are next-level manga Sandy Duncan Overdrive. It's like Al Hartley is determined to hypnotize us if all else fails. Unsettling. Hot on its heels comes lip service, where Archie and Betty are making out on the couch. Archie is blown away, I guess because his pillow doesn't kiss back? But his fun is interrupted when the doorbell rings. Arch is ready for another round, but Betty runs off. Someone might need her. Well, I'm guessing Archie needs you pretty badly right now, Betty, but sure, go answer the goddamn door. And wouldn't you know it, here's an inconsolable big Ethel on the scene to douse the passion. Ethel is upset because God made her too tall and gawky and buck-toothed. Hey, you, uh, forgot poor. Might as well throw that in, too. His hot date, now a cold shower, Archie clenches his fist, wondering if Ethel would fit in the wood chipper. However, Betty has an endless supply of platitudes to numb this great beast into submission. She feeds Ethel a load of bull, eventually lulling the bawling teen into a beatific state. Trying to be a good egg, Archie tries to pay Ethel a compliment, and she hi-hats him. She's got a date with her Bible. Yeah, you get the idea. While these are Archie characters in appearance, they're all just talking heads for Hartley and his message. Whatever distinctive character traits remain are so snowed under by the dogma that you periodically need to be reminded of whose adventures you're reading by Jughead talking about a hamburger or something. It must have been very odd indeed to see the gang meeting spies, aliens, and rock stars over in their regular titles only to run into this. It's like Arch and his pals were cloned or something, but their genetic makeup is unstable, resulting in their big dead eyes, slack jaws, and dogmatic banter. Honestly, it hurts my brain, so let's just wrap it up. The last story takes place on a beach. It's a nice change of pace from what's gone on before, but not all is as it seems. While the view is idyllic from where the teens sit, just over the hill lies some nasty old pollution. Betty points out all the negatives she sees, which is kind of a bitchy thing to do in spite of being so keen on Jesus. She busts Jughead's chops for simply eating a light lunch as well as this poor guy trying to visit Flavor Country and a couple of scrubby near duels on a nearby dope deal. Man, Riverdale's really gone downhill. Instead of all this preaching, maybe hire a few cops. A little community outreach goes a long way. Anyway, we get some more lecturing from goody-good Betty, who takes a cheap shot at liquor next. Veronica, who I assume is rocking at least a little buzz, takes offense at this on the reader's behalf. By besmirching the good names of Johnny Walker and Jim Beam, little Miss Cooper has gone one step too far. We're supposed to give her a pass because Betty has something in her, but from the look on Ronnie's face, that something may just end up being a boot in the ass. Spire continued to produce comics featuring the Archie Gang up until 1984, which didn't help the book's standing among we secular readers. But Spire did more than just Archie. In one of our first Comics for Breakfast episodes, we looked at Al Hartley's adaptation of the popular book-slash-movie The Cross and the Switchblade, 
And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Spire produced comics on subjects ranging from Man in Black musical outlaw Johnny Cash to swastika-loving teen Hansi, staying remarkably on point in spite of their wide variety of subjects. As a palate cleanser to all of this, we're pulling out a regular normal Archie from 1984. And this one is all about the beach. I guess before all the pollution and dime bags and stuff. In Bucket Brigade, the kids go in search of a place to set up their blanket. But while Betty and Veronica are managing just fine, old Archie is burning his tender tootsies on the hot sand. Once set up, it's not long before the girls get it into their heads that what they really need are a couple of nice cold sodas, driving the enraged ginger teen back onto the blazing beach. Archie falls onto the blanket of a comely brunette who, it turns out, is dating this proto-Ron Jeremy. Understandably alarmed, Archie hops off, leaving a trail of havoc in his wake. Undeterred from his task, Archie decides his best bet is to pop two plastic buckets onto his feet, leading to this nightmarish scenario. My God, did his feet melt? Somebody get this kid a pair of Keds. In Bored to Tears, Archie is busy reenacting the rhyme of the ancient mariner with a pesky seagull when rival Reggie streaks by. He mocks Archie, and for good reason. Arch stinks on the waves. Only Reggie isn't much better, inadvertently knocking himself out on Archie's board while showing off. Being the good kid that he is, Archie fishes Reg from the water and drags his sorry carcass to shore, where the gang makes sport of his unconscious form for two pages. It's not complex storytelling by any means, but the art is lovely, and there's just something funny about people standing around mocking someone who may have suffered a traumatic brain injury. Next, we get the rare Mr. Lodge feature. Hey, we OGs need representation, too. Lodge is out jogging with Archie's dad, oddly enough. Are they buddies? Did they bury a body together? We don't get any inside information on their relationship, but we do get a succession of gags where the kids all leave the old men in the dust. Seriously, when Betty smokes you, you know you've got to up your game. And while it seems an ignoble defeat for the oldsters, we get a stunning reprisal in the form of generational imperialist power when the grown-ups chastise and then banish those do-nothing kids from the pool. Go swim at Reggie's house, you ungrateful bastards. Our last story in the issue is more beach-going, specifically Arch and Jug ignoring the girls to build a sandcastle. We get a nice back and forth between Betty and Veronica, emphasizing their different, well, let's just say intellectual capacities. Betty attempts to shame the fellows, but the boys are steadfast in their pursuit and simply move on down the beach. Unfortunately, their new real estate is right in the path of their fellow beachgoers, and shenanigans ensue. However, when a beautitious brunette stumbles into the frame, it's every man for himself, as Archie is more interested in getting to know this cumbersome giantess than finishing his little project. We're left with a panel of the girl steaming, with Jughead getting in the last laugh. It's a cute little story and a book full of wholesome fun, and a dramatic 180 from the previous Spire comic. Here, Archie and his pals are as they're meant to be, wholesome by nature and not by design. We don't need to be preached to or proselytized at. The gang does the right thing because they're good kids, not because their morality is dictated to them from someone who seems intentionally obtuse when it comes to the subtleties of youth. But hey... Don't take my word for it. Decide for yourself. And finally, a book that I teased last week on having a drink with Mink. It's Josie and the Pussycats, number 72, and it's a doozy. Duck your heads, mind the sudden drops, and join me in The Crypt of Vengeance. Alexandra goes to the family tomb with flowers for her recently deceased grandfather, Josie and the Gang in Tow. Alex notes the smell of death in the air, but Mallory assures her it's just the damp. In fact, Val seems kind of stuck on the subject, but nobody's here to read about comparative dankness. 
Josie discovers a stairway leading to a lower tube and heads down where an invisible, malign presence envelops her innocent self. The Josie that emerges is not the sweet kid that went down. Now, she's evil. How evil? Well, listen to her monologue. <laughs> Cackle. Wheeze. And it's not just her exciting new vocabulary. The group heads back to Melody's place to unwind, but Josie has her heart set on some interior decoration and sets the living room curtains on fire before flipping her lid and attacking her host. Meathead Alex pulls Josie away, but the fiery teen's built up a head of steam and isn't about to let this chump spoil her demonic fun. Josie tears loose screeching and, I quote, maledictions that purpled the very atmosphere. Well, I guess someone read Poe in high school. Shouting hate, kill, revenge, Josie goes blood simple and starts smashing the joint up. Alex tries to subdue her and Josie gropes for a weapon, her hand falling upon a conveniently placed Bible. The book seems to burn Josie and she tosses it aside. The gang decide that the good book is clearly their best hope, but instead of, I don't know, reading from it, they just kind of jam it into her hand. Josie goes limp and Alex relents, but Valerie stops him. Not only is she an expert on tomb humidity, but she knows a little something about exorcism, too. She insists that Josie hold on to the Bible until, well, you read it and tell me. Unless you think I'm going out on a limb here. So yeah, apparently Josie farts the demon out of her body. You know, when I do it, everybody freaks out and makes a big goddamn deal, and I don't even try and blame it on Satan. Anyway, Melody's father appears just then and seems completely willing to believe that one of his dead relatives has returned and possessed one of his daughter's friends. Dude, it's 1973. You have to at least consider acid. I mean, Josie's a rock star. Maybe that tab of orange sunshine she had at lunchtime wasn't bunk. Or maybe she just ate a bad taco. That might also account for the aura of putrefying death. At any rate, Alexandra and the gang troop back to the tomb, Bible in hand. With a wave, the evil Aunt Julia's coffin crumbles to dust, never to haunt our teeners again. In the final panel, we see a return to normalcy. And hey, Josie's healed without scars. It looks like it's all gonna be alright. At least... Until Melody goes to pay her respects to her dear departed aunt in Transylvania. So yeah, pretty weird, especially for an Archie publication. But remember, The Exorcist had just come out and everyone was losing their minds over the idea of demonic possession. Now, I wouldn't have expected a company like Archie to emulate a trend set in effect by what? remains a very adult horror movie uh but at the same time they were beginning their relationship with spire to boot it's a really weird fit the question is did they do more like this is there an issue where the riverdale gang go to texas and encounter a homicidal chainsaw wielding maniac or maybe spend the night in a secluded ski lodge where jughead loses his mind from his lack of hamburgers and malteds and goes on a killing spree if so, let me know. Thank you for joining us. If you dug this episode, like, share, and subscribe. If it truly gave you beatific visions, then maybe head on over to the Old Guys Who Like Old Comics swag shop. Christmas is just around the corner, and maybe an OG that you know would love a mug, a t-shirt, or one of the other fine items that we made available to you. For the old guys who like old comics network, I'm Jason Mink, and I hope to see you next week at breakfast.